All right, I think we're here. We have all kinds of people joining us. Um, so I know people will trickle in as we go, um, but looking forward to having a, a great conversation today and having so many of you join us for this special conversation with Dr. Carl Schock. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Thomas Bandar. I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of Lutheran Summer Music. We're excited that you're here to join us, um, and we're just thrilled that Dr. Schock was able to share this time with us. So before we really dive in, I wanted to say first, um, happy birthday, Carl. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Schock just turned 91. Is it okay if I share that? I should have asked you beforehand, but um, we're, we're, we're excited to be with you on just, just right around your, your birthday and, and have this align with a, a special day for you. That's great. Um, so as we're getting started here, just uh, letting everyone know that uh, Dr. Schock is the 2021 recipient of the LSM Messerly Service Award. Um, an award that we we started last a couple years ago here to uh, honor somebody who has really lived into the mission of LSM uh, for many years. And uh, Carlos Messerly received the first award a few years ago, Phyllis Duesenberg last year, and now we're honored that, that Dr. Schock re is receiving it now and into 2021. Of course, we wished we could have this per this conversation in person during LSM, um, but you know here we are virtually instead, and we hope to do it again in person. Uh, next summer, if we are all able to gather for LSM 2021. Uh, along with the service award, uh, we are starting a new scholarship fund named after Dr. Carl Schock and uh, one that will enable even more students to enjoy the LSM experience, come for the transformational uh, immersive experience on campus and, le and leave ready to be um, in service to music to the church and, and to uh, a path lived, um, living up to Dr. Carl Schock's legacy as well. So what I'm going to do in the comments and for those of you watching on Facebook is put in a, uh, a link to some place that you can go and check out that uh, scholarship fund if you're so moved to contribute to that. Um, I'm also going to post an address. Uh, many of you have been sharing little bits of stories and information that you would like passed on to Dr. Carl Schock. And I will say that we will give everything uh, over to, to Dr. Schock, any sort of um, messages you wanted to pass along. So if you wanted to type something in today, if you wanted to mail a card or anything like that, we will be sure that Dr. Schock uh, gets any sort of uh, well wishes that, that you would like to send as well. So I will get that going and then um, a little bit about how this will work for this hour that we're together today. I just have a couple broad questions that I'll start with for, for Dr. Schock and then um, he'll give us a little bit of an overview and then love to hear from all of you joining us. What, what would you like to discuss? What would you like to hear uh, from Dr. Schock today? So those of you who are on Zoom, you can check out below the Q&A button that's down there. Just click on that, uh, type in a question and I'll be monitoring those throughout the conversation and we'll be able to, to read uh, hopefully many of those. And then those of you on Facebook as well, chime in on the comments, uh, we'll monitor those and we'll, we'll kind of put all these together and answer as many as we can um, as we're, we're getting into it. So again, welcome. And with that, let's just jump right in. So uh, Dr. Schock was heavily involved about 40 years ago with the, just the beginnings of, of LSM when it was maybe just a thread of an idea. And so I'm wondering if you could just share with us your memories from mm -hmm. 1980, 1981, 1982, when we got to the very first summer um, at St. Olaf, how that all came to be, what was going on at this time, and really why was this all put together in the first place? Well, th first of all, thank you for the honor that you've given me. And I've very been, been very pleased to be associated with Lutheran summer music for all these years. Uh, while the first uh, actual Lutheran summer music was in 1982, uh, the, the germ of the idea began a couple of years earlier. And as I recall it, it was a notion in the mind of uh, Pastor Ewald Muller of uh, Ridgewood, New Jersey who had become aware of the fact that uh, uh, Valparaiso University had come into possession 
of a camp in the Poconos. And it was uh, just sort of sitting there and he thought maybe that could be transformed into some kind of a music camp of, uh, for high school students. And uh, so he pitched the idea to his, I believe, seminary classmate, but at least a near classmate, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, who has, was at that time the uh, vice president at AAL, Aid Association for Lutherans. It's now Thrivent Financial for Lutherans. And he was in charge of uh, overseeing the uh, many requests they had for uh, uh, grants and loans and, and uh, grants, really, to uh, find uh, interesting projects that they could do to help uh, in the Lutheran cause in this country. And so he pitched that idea to him. And as a result, Dr. Koenigy uh, called a meeting of about eight or, I think there were eight or 10 of us, uh, one weekend in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is where the AAL was located. And uh, the people who were there were mostly music department uh, chairs or, or people who taught in the music departments of a wide variety of Lutheran colleges and universities in the United States. And uh, the idea was laid out and uh, we were there for about two days. And uh, we thought, yeah, that, that, that maybe there's a germ of an idea there, uh, but it needed more study. And so the uh, AAL agreed to fund a study, a year long study, uh, in depth to find out, was there any appetite at all for this kind of thing? Would Lutherans welcome this? Where would it be? How would it work? Uh, who would be involved? All those kinds of uh, questions. And so uh, they hired to do the study, Dr. Carlos Messerly, and who had uh, recently uh, re retired from Concordia Teachers College in Seward, Nebraska. And uh, Carlos was a near classmate of mine at Concordia Teachers College in River Forest. So we knew each other well uh, over the years. He was about uh, two years, two or three years older than I was, but we knew each other well. And so in his studies and in, in his work, it, trying to discover what should be done about this project, he, was, he did, involved a lot of traveling talking to Lutheran high school band directors, choral directors, uh, college uh, stuff at colleges and talked with people at a variety of colleges. And he would often stop then in Chicago because that was the most, most convenient uh, for traveling. Uh, Carlos was located in Lincoln, Nebraska, where he had a little office to do all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he would stop here and then we would just informally talk over what he'd been finding and discussing what was going on. Well, he did that for a year and presented the results then to, uh, to uh, AAL. And the AAL uh, decided that they would fund this new project for three years, which was their normal practice. A, a declining amount each year, so that by the end of three years, if this was a good idea, it will have been uh, proven by itself that it will be gaining traction and so on, and can take over then the financial support of it. And so uh, that was kind of the basic gr groundwork. But I think it's important to mention three things about that, that uh, final study and recommendations that Car uh, Carlos had made. Uh, the first thing was that Carlos was convinced uh, that this should be more than many of the uh, very fine choral and band camps that were being held around the country, also among some Lutherans, which were usually consisted of two or three days over a long weekend or maybe a week long where you had just about enough time for the students to find their way between their dormitory 
in the cafeteria in the rehearsal room, and they just were finding their way around, and it was over already. And Carlos thought there needed to be a longer period of time to develop students' uh, skills, and, and it, it was more than to just develop enthusiasm for the idea. And so he, he suggested that it be a one month long program. Uh, well, one of the questions was, would parents be willing to send their uh, young teenagers off to a camp for a month, many of whom had perhaps never been away from home? And, and all kinds of questions like that. That was one point. It should be a month long. Uh, in addition to the, uh, well, it would certainly duplicate what was being done in terms of large ensembles. These, uh, his vision was that there would be obviously large ensembles, an orchestra, a band, a choir, uh, in, in which everyone would, everyone would participate in one or the other of those. But then Carlos also said there's a need to develop the individual skills of these uh, young people. And so he projected that every student should have private lessons in their instrument, whether that would be voice or flute or cello or tuba, whatever it would be, and th that they would have two private lessons a week, uh, which for many young teenagers would be quite a bit, two private lessons a week. But so you had the large, the large uh, ensemble experience, you had the private lessons, and then the third was the intermediate stage in which every student would belong in some way or other to a small ensemble. It might be a flute ensemble, it might be a, a two violins, cello, and continuo, it might be a string quartet, it might be a wind ensemble of some kind, brass or, or whatever, uh, but everyone should have those three levels of participation. And uh, that was his vision. And uh, that was the way the plan was. And then I'll mention one more thing. It was this that Carlos said, well, this is to be uh, what the name su suggested Lutheran at the time, Lutheran summer music. Well, what was there that was Lutheran about this other than the, the, the most of the young people were Lutheran was being sponsored by Lutherans. He said, no, you have to do something at the camp every day that would be Lutheran, part of the Lutheran tradition. And so he said, every day we will close the day by having the whole group come together and sing together and pray together evening prayer. And for many young people, that was a new experience. It was a new experience for many people because 1982 was just four years after the publication of, Lu of the uh, Lutheran Book of Worship, uh, and many congregations were getting used to that. And here they, the young people would uh, be learning and then experience that, that for every day of the camp, uh, seven days a week. And uh, it was an interesting little by piece of, uh, of information that uh, we discovered once the camp began that toward the end of the camp uh, as you can be approach the last week somewhere in there the, the every all the students received a, an evaluation form uh, how did you like the food in the cafeteria did you get along with your teacher how about how were the living accommodations? What about your your other mates that you worked with? All those kinds of questions. And at the end of the uh, of the evaluation sheet was was a question something like this: What was it about this camp, this Lutheran summer music one month experience, that you will take with you? Take with you home, hopefully that has made the most impression on you. 
And almost without exception, year after year, the, the answer was the same. It is, the young people said, it's the gathering every day for evening prayer. That's what made it specially significant in their lives. And uh, that was really one of the ultimate goals of, of the purpose of the camp. And so it was interesting to see how that, how that developed. Here they were uh, go, go, going to church every day in the evening and doing essentially the same thing every day. And uh, they grew into that practice, that daily rhythm, that, that spiritual discipline of evening prayer. And that's what they remembered and took with them. Uh, in addition to all the musical skills and experiences that they've had. And so that was kind of how that, be, that began. One more thing I want to say, and then I'll stop to you. Maybe you want to have a question. Uh, I don't want to start mentioning names because then I'll forget some. But two names that I have to, remember, have to mention is that in the run-up to the opening of the camp and then in the beginning years, there were two people who were absolutely indispensable. Uh, early on, Carlos, in, in, uh, as he opened a little office in Lincoln, Nebraska, he hired Sandy Anderson to be his secretary and to, to kind of do all the uh, secretarial and work and more that belonged to that. And uh, if any one of you has worked, had worked with Carlos, you would remember him as a person who wanted to make sure every T was crossed, every I was dotted, it was, everything had to be just so. And Sandy was crucial to that whole endeavor. And the second person I wanted to mention is John Lundy, who uh, was hired as essentially to recruit, recruit students, recruit faculty, uh, uh, mostly students, uh, and to make sure you had enough students in the right places. If you're going to have a symphony orchestra, you have to have so many of this instrument, so many of that instrument. You can't have two flutes and eight tubas. That won't work. And so he was balancing all that. And I remember that he would come to work often late in the afternoon and stay well into the evening because he was on the phone. Uh, talking to high school students, recruiting them for this endeavor. And so Sandy Anderson and John Lundy were crucial to that, and my hat's off to them. And uh, maybe they're online there somewhere. And uh, I think we just need to recognize that fact. Well, let me, let me just stop there, and maybe you want to have a comment or question. Oh, sure. Well, thank you, Carl. We're, we'll make sure that Sandy and John hear this. I know they're they're, they're still uh, great advocates of, of LSM. And just an incredible testament to what uh, Carlos and you all put together 40 years ago. This is still the framework and what drives the program now, 40 years later. This is so many of the similar components, um, and it's the same highlights of, of evening prayer being something that is so grounding for people and something that the students do then take off, uh, take from LSM into their their home lives and beyond. And I, I think a testament to what, what you all put together, the same yeah. model is so strong today. Yeah, uh, let me just say that um, very, w w once there was a board established and it was beginning to work, uh, I was not a member of the board, but Carlos invited me to come to every member of the board meeting. Uh, to be uh, a fly on the wall. I would sit in the back of the room and just listen. And then after the uh, meeting was over, uh, Carlos and Sandy and John and I uh, would uh, maybe have supper together. And we would kind of uh, go over the meeting and say, well, that was a really good idea that someone suggested. And maybe this was maybe not such a good idea. And we would hash through what what had gone on in the meeting, and uh, and so I was always kind of a fly on the wall there in the, in in the boardroom, and 
finally the board members, I think, got tired of me sitting in the back of the room and said, why don't you be a member of the board? And so then I, I just moved my chair up a little bit. That, that's about what it was. And then I served then until my retirement. But uh, it was, uh, it was a, a fascinating time because this was all uncharted, wa uncharted waters. And of course, one of, the, one of the other things that was built into the program is that was that this program should be available to Lutherans of all stripes. And to and uh, that these young people would come from from Lutheran groups of all kinds, and uh, there were kind of uncharted waters there that had to be ne negotiated without causing any one of them. And uh, I think the board did a wonderful job of that, and uh, that was kind of how. I was kind of always at the meetings in one capacity or another. Uh, in the very early years, I was the fly on the wall, and uh, but it was it, it was a, a truly wonderful experience. Yeah. Well, LSM brings so many different kinds of people together. It's just still a wonderful program. Um, I want to just reiterate this: the traditions that you were talking about here, and uh, counter to evening prayer, morning prayer starts essentially every day at LSM as well, and your name is now synonymous with Luther's morning prayer, so much so that I, I feel like I have to correct people, or maybe it's a little bit of a joke where you say, who, who wrote Luther's morning prayer? Uh, it turns out it's not Karl Schock, um, but, but Martin Luther wrote Luther's morning prayer, and Karl Schock just set it exquisitely to music. Um, and so many people have heard that and told me this is what starts there every day, um, and I just wondered if you share some, some information about how that came to be and what that what that piece means to you, right? Uh, th well, that was an interesting story, because in the last of the four weeks, as 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 this uh, program was going to be coming to the final week, uh, the 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 situation was that uh, on uh, the three main concerts originally three main concerts: Thursday night band concert, Friday night choral, choral concert, Saturday night. Uh, orchestra concert, and then later the, the hymn festival was added on Wednesday, Wednesday night. And um, the, the parents would, of course, be coming for the final service on Sunday morning. They would come on Saturday so they could attend the, the orchestral concert on Saturday night. And then the next day, take their young people home again. And uh, what began to happen was that parents were invited to come earlier in the week if, if they were able, if they wanted to, that they could come maybe Wednesday and be part of not only hearing those four evening concerts, but being part of hearing the individual recitals or small group ensemble recitals that were taking place every day during that, well, the, the, the last three or four days of the, of the last week. And so they could come and listen to their daughters and sons uh, who were playing maybe a, a, a whole a, a, a private recital, or maybe two or three would go together and make a recital. It might be an ensemble, small ensemble. Those playing, there were enough recitals going on through the day. And so if parents wanted to come and hear what Lutheran summer music was all about. They had a chance to do all that. Well, on the Saturday evening concert, it was customary that uh, immediately at the, be or at the very beginning of the concert, the executive director would, would uh, greet the audience and then uh, uh, thank particularly those members of the board who were, whose service had ended and were now leaving the board. And uh, th this one year, uh, the uh, uh, we'll mention his name because he's a, was a formidable, is a formidable figure. But he, at that time, he was the chief finance person on the board, and that was Dieter Nickel, uh, who lived in Merrill, Wisconsin, and was the CEO of uh, of Church Mutual Insurance Company, and and he was a, a 
one of the early members of the board. He he was a I, I he was a, a, a an am, he was he he would say he was an amateur oboe player. He had played oboe in college and and he was still playing occasionally in his home congregation a couple times a year. And uh, he was retiring now off the board after a long time of service. And the president of the board at that time was David Levy, who was a longtime professor at Notre Dame in political science and uh, ardent uh, uh, music lover as his wife was a church musician. And uh, he was president of the board and he had said to, to Dieter that uh, we're going to do this. We'll, we'll say a few kind words about you and you know, give you the equivalent of a gold watch, not a gold watch, but the, give you something, a plaque or something. And Dieter said, I don't want any plaque. He said, don't give me a plaque. He said, I have too many plaques. I'm not gonna put it up anyways. So <laughs> that was Dieter. And so David came to me and said, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> do I have any ideas? And I said, well, at the end of every day, everyone comes together for evening prayer. I said, in the morning, the, 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 the group does something that they called morning prayer, but it really wasn't morning prayer. At the end of breakfast, I think it was, uh, when breakfast was over, the, uh, the camp director would get up and, uh, and make announcements for the day. Uh, schedule changes or whatever is going on particularly and then they somebody would say if you might read scripture passage and they'd sing a hymn and off they go to a busy day and uh, they call that morning prayer and I said that's not really morning prayer but I said Martin Luther uh, wrote a, a, a prayer in, in, in you'll find it in his small catechism and he says in the morning, when you get up, he says, make the sign of the cross and say in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then say this prayer. And then he has this little prayer about thanks, thanksgiving for being kept safely over the through the night hours and now strength for the new day. And then when the prayer is over, he says, you can sing a hymn and then go cheerfully to your work. And that was it. So it was very short. And I said, well, maybe I could try my hand at taking Luther's morning prayer and uh, setting it to music that the group could sing a cappella in parts, a, a, a hymn-like setting. And uh, David thought that was a good idea. So I did that and, and presented it. And, and uh, how it was presented that first time was it, it had been, apparently been taught to the whole group, the whole camp, in the week before. And so the orchestra is up there on the stage Saturday night, ready to do their concert. The announcements were done, and the executive director invited them, the, all of the other students who were in the audience, to come and join the ones on the stand around on the stage, all the faculty, join everybody on the stage and then they sang from memory Luther's morning prayer that I had written for them in honor of Dieter's service and uh, that's how he first heard it and uh, since then I believe it's been pretty much since then every morning they start start the morning by the whole group uh, singing as part of their morning devotion at breakfast or immediately after breakfast, I'm not exactly where it is now, uh, singing. So you began the, the day with Luther's morning prayer and then you ended the day with the church's evening prayer. So, and, and, and what, a, what a terrific, terrific thing. It's something that the students now just have learned by osmosis and as new as old students come back year after after the after the year, and the, the the new students learn that very quickly, and it's quickly memorized, and so they can just sing it. and And as you mentioned, 
Tom, uh, the uh, I've heard stories too about they go back to their home congregation or into their family and say, why can't we sing this? Or why can't we do something like this in our family, in our congregation? And uh, so it's uh, turned out to be something really uh, has grown into, a, I think, a very fine tradition that uh, is associated with Lutheran summer music. And, uh, and, and it's, for me personally, it's very satisfying because they'll, uh, the students will come and go through two, three, four years of Lutheran summer music, having sung this every day, and they, they don't know who the heck I am. They wouldn't know me from all the ground. But this prayer, which I've done, has managed to seep into their being and to be part of their religious dimension that, that they express in their personal life, in their family life, sometimes in their congregational life. And that's a very satisfying thing for me. So thank you for asking about that. It's still perhaps the most special time of the summer is at, at the end when, when everyone gathers to sing it one last time. And we invite all the alumni who are in attendance to join us for that as, as many, of, uh, many of the alumni remember doing it when they were a student. And it is a, while it's a joyful time, it is, there's a lot of tears at that moment as we're, we're all about to say goodbye for the summer and, and, and return to our other parts of our lives. And that's just, has, has so many meanings to people. And, has, has touched and just countless people. Um, so thanks for sharing us with us that story. So just a reminder, those of you who have, were a little bit late joining us, if you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A button on Zoom and we're going to get to those now. Those of you on Facebook, feel free to type them into the comments and we'll get to as many of those as we can also. we we'll are monitor everything that we can. Um, I will reshare the, the link for the scholarship funds just so that we all see that. And I'll also follow up with an email for those of you on, on Zoom so that um, you can, uh, you don't have to necessarily click it right now. You can see that. Um, and also the mailing address for anybody who would like to, to share a card or anything like that with, with Carl. And again, know that anything that's written here in the, the comments or on Facebook, we'll make sure that, that Carl does see. So any kind of re uh, memories that people are sharing, we're, we'll compile all those um, as, as well. So I'm going to jump in with some of these questions that are, that are popping up. Um, so first off, uh, are you still writing music? Oh, yes. Every day. Every day. Pretty, pretty, pretty much every day, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's, uh, people people uh, still ask me if... Uh, if I'm doing that, well, every once in a while, I, I received a, a, a phone call from a pastor in, in a Midwestern state, and he said, am I talking to Carl Chalk? And I said, yes, you are. Oh, good. He said, I wasn't sure if you were living or dead yet. But, and then he wanted to ask me if I would be willing to write something for, uh, for the, the choir at the, at the church. Yes. So the answer is yes. I'm, I'm, I always have something I'm writing, right. So uh, uh, one small follow-up question. Somebody asked um, when Luther, Luther's Morning Prayer was composed, and I, I can look that up if you don't remember exactly. I, I can't tell you the exact date. I know it was at Peter Nichols' retirement and David Levy was the president of the board. I can't tell you the exact, the exact year. I, I will look that up and put that in the follow-up note for everybody yeah. if I don't get the year wrong. Um, but so uh, just maybe reflecting for yourself, uh, how has the LSM experience, uh, how, what impact has LSM had on you, um, so let alone the students? Well, uh, as, as I referred to, you know, it, it's, it's super gratifying that the, some something you 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 do some something you in this case a, a piece of music that you write has gone out into the ether and and, and it suddenly has become embedded into this program in a way that none of us ever thought would be the okay you don't write you don't write at least in myself you don't write 
sit down and say, I'm going to write a piece that they will be singing from now until the parousia. You, you, you write for whatever the immediate need is, or if someone asks you, or whatever the cause is, and whatever happens to it beyond that. And uh, to see that uh, music that you've written is, is it being used by people whom I don't know, and they don't know me, but it seems to have served some good purpose in their church, in their congregation, in their lives, and, and that people have found meaningful. That, that's, that, that's a very uh, wonderful feeling that, that you're doing something that's good, even though I don't know who those people are who are using it, uh, or they don't know me. I'm just a name on something there, uh, but it's 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 uh, it's very gratifying to, uh, to 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 do that and and to to realize that your work, at least for a while, is living beyond your your own self and your own ima imagination. Um, so, especially in these days, in these difficult days, uh, especially for church musicians, even of all ages. What encouraging words would you give to current or aspiring church musicians or, or really anyone who is um, trying to navigate all that we're going through right now? Well, yeah, so all that, it, we're, it's difficult times, yes. And uh, uh, what's interesting to me is, is that church musicians are finding super creative ways of getting around the problems here that with the pandemic and so on and all that. And at some point, I'm sure we'll be returning to something that will be a new normal. It may not be quite like the old normal, but when choirs are getting back together in some way or other, uh, it's, it's, it's beginning to happen in some places. But it's a, it's a challenge. There's no question in the parish that I, that I attend. It's, a, it's always a, a, a but, but there are ingenious ways that people are finding to work around, work around the problems or to find other solutions. And I, I'm very hopeful about the, the future that, the, uh, that, that will ultimately emerge out of all of out of this because there will still be choirs, there'll still be a need for organists and, and all those kinds of things that we assume with the old normal, which uh, in some way will return in some fashion. And uh, I, I think we can look forward to that. In the meantime, we just have to kind of uh, use our best ideas, our best wits, and, and we'll, we'll weather this particular storm and then it'll be we'll be coming back gradually to some kind of a new norm pretty soon right oh well, thank you and i'm being told by all kinds of people and i haven't looked it up myself but this this memory does serve that 2011 was when uh, you composed your setting of luther's morning prayer so oh, okay. those, those of you who are curious of when that when that was it was 2011. Oh, okay. uh, so we received multiple versions of this kind of question. Uh, what did you once imagine the impact of LSM to be on the music of the church in general? And, and now that we're you know, so far, far beyond that 40 years later, um, how do you think now about that impact uh, in areas that you predicted and some of those that are unexpected? Well, I think one of the, one of the uh, visions that Carlos had for it, which I certainly shared, was that not only would this be an opportunity for young people who are really interested in music to, to come together with a lot of their peers who were just as interested as they were uh, in, in talking about music and things musical, and that that was kind of the focus of their conversation. Not with the idea that everyone that attends LSM is going to become a professional musician or even a professional church musician. Some will, but if they don't, they are becoming educated musical artists to a level that they did not think they were able to do before. 
uh, and so it stretched them and they go back into their parishes and, and ultimately understand, even though that's not their, vo their daily vocation, they understand it much better what church musicians, choir people, instrumentalists in church, what, all, what they are trying to do and how they're doing it. And it, it simply is as educa educated lay people who are at least somewhat proficient in music, in playing an instrument, in, in singing, whatever it is, that all of that redounds to the, to the enriching of the musical culture and the musical life in, in congregations. And I think you've, you've certainly seen that. Uh, I had the, the experience of, uh, uh, I needed uh, someone to do some secretarial work for me. And so I called uh, uh, over at Concordia River Forest to see if they could provide someone uh, who had some secretarial skills. And they sent me a young lady and, uh, who was very good, excellent. And uh, she said, oh, yes, she went to LSM. And she said, actually, she said, uh, about her parents met when they were both students at LSM, like 30 years before. And they got married, and they had a daughter. And now she was going, she had gone to LSM. And now she was graduating from, from uh, college and going into work. And th I think that's kind of emblematic of what goes on, at least often, that, that you know, generation, you're getting to the next generation now of students whose, whose parents or one of the parents may have gone to LSM. And it's building that kind of a foundation that is, it, it's, that you want to have educated lay people, educated also in music and the arts in your congregation. And that's also what LSM is doing. And I think that's a wonderful thing that's happening. Incredibly powerful, thank you. Um, we're just shifting away from LSM, LSM itself for a moment. Would you mind commenting on your involvement in the development of, of any of the Lutheran hymnals? Uh, well, yes, um, uh, I, I was involved with uh, the development of the Lutheran book, of, Lutheran book of Worship, which was published in 1978, and that was for a period of about 10 years in the making. And uh, that, as I mentioned, that came out in 78, and then LSM was shortly in the wake of that. And so much of what was in LBW, Lutheran, Book of Worship, which we need to be reminded, was prepared by uh, committees of all the Lutheran churches, the, all the different branches of Lutheranism in America, except for one or two. Uh, and, and as it says clearly on the front page. And so congregations were learning not just the new musical settings, but also some of the new uh, ideas which were incorporated into that book. And LSM was part of the way that that kind of uh, musical experience was uh, translated for these young people at LSM. And then also as they carried that back into their, in, into their parishes. I know, for example, of young people who went back to their parish and said to their pastor, why can't we have L uh, evening prayer? more often in our church. Now, when was the last time you heard middle, uh, uh, you know, high school students coming to their pastor and saying, why don't you ask them more church? <laughs> it, it seems counterintuitive, but uh, the, that was going on. And, uh, and that's, the kind of, that's the kind of enthusiasm and, and uh, interest that you want to see develop in young kids. And they were looking well, I, I didn't mention this, but I think one of the things why evening prayer at LSM was so, has been over the years so effective and that students understand it to be 
a, a rich and deeper experience is simply because we often overlook the fact that what young people are looking for in a period in their life when they're undergoing all kinds of change, changes and meeting new challenges of, uh, of all kinds, that they're also looking for stability and continuity. And that evening prayer was one element where that they could count every day. There is a there is a there is a place where we we know exactly what what it is, and we can experience that, and we experience the same thing day after day as we dig deeper into its meaning and its experience. And I think that idea of continuity and stability. Uh, we overlooked that you know, many young people are looking for exactly that, although they may not always say it. And, and this was a, a way of helping that happen. And uh, that was all part of this experience. And I, I think it was, I, I think, you know, in, in many cases, it's turned out to be exactly what the, I know Carlos had hoped for. Such a powerful statement, what you just said about young people desiring that depth and this being the, the place and, and through LSM through, through evening prayer being the place that they find that consistency and continuity and um, that sometimes runs counterintuitive to what we hear in other places in the culture but uh, we've just seen now generations and generations of that being successful so th thanks for mm -hmm for sharing that in your own words. So keep the questions coming. It's great uh, both on, on Zoom on the, the Q&A feature and then also in the comments on Facebook, we have 15 or so minutes left. So um, keep them coming in. Um, exciting, a question here from a current LSM student who I, I know is for, uh, a composer as well, asking about your approaches to composing church music. You know, where do you start and what are your main considerations? Well, well, as far as I'm concerned, I, I'm sure there are many different ways of doing this, but I, st I start with the words. I need to have words. Uh, I, I don't write a melody and then try to find words to fit them. Uh, there are, uh, the, the normal, my normal procedure is I, I see a need uh, for a particular kind of text, and then I look for a text. Usually, you don't need to find a new text. You can find many uh, older texts. Uh, right now I'm working on, on, on the text from the, the third, fourth century uh, in, in English translation, of course, uh, which has to do with uh, Holy Communion. And uh, th there are so many rich texts like that are available and, th and every hymnal cannot contain them all. So you need to, if you're looking for texts, you need to have a, a wider variety of resources than just the one hymnal that you happen to be using. You need to use that too. But uh, so that's where I start. And it needs to be, a, in my view, a, a text that is useful liturgically. It's not just any religious text, any, any, any text that, uh, that, that, that maybe even a biblical text there, there are all kinds of biblical texts that I think would not be particularly suited for use in worship. Uh, it, I, I think that there are a lot of texts floating around. You, you can go on YouTube and just look at a lot of religious songs. As long as you mention Jesus, you say Jesus, that's the, then, then it's okay. No, that's, that's not quite it. That's not quite it. It has to have a little more depth than that because a, a church musician is not to, is a musician, but is also a church musician, which means that the, that the, the song you are writing, uh, hopefully if, if you're ready for church, is to be the song of the church. It's a song. The you we join the church's song. We may we add to it, but it comes from a rooting and a, and a foundation in what the church has been singing. It's, it's not that, uh, for example, uh, when we sing, here, here would be a typical misunderstanding. When we sing every Sunday, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, 
We laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing holy, holy, holy. Uh, many congregations uh, think, without thinking too much about it, isn't it nice that we're here at St. John's by the gas station and we're singing our songs and the angels and archangels, all the company of heaven are singing along with us. That's just backwards, I, I think it is. It's that the song of the church, which is sung by angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, is a song that we, in our time, are, are honored that we are able to join in that song, which has been sung long before we ever appeared on the scene, and which will continue to be sung long after we're gone. We join that song to therefore with angels and archangels, we sing our praises. And uh, so is it that kind of a text that lends itself to that? Uh, just any kind of religious text, because it has some kind of spiritual dimension, uh, that's not enough. It has to be, it has to be a text with, in my regard, which in some way or other, uh, carries out the message of the gospel, which is the narrative of salvation history, the story of what God has done. Uh, one of the current hymn, new hymn, that I like to, uh, to uh, quote, and it's a very popular hymn, which I think expresses it very well. It's the hymn, Rise, Shiny People, Christ the Lord has entered our human story. God in him is centered. And, and so it begins that, and then finally it says, it, it, it's, it's a hymn that says, tell, at the last stanza, tell how the Father sent his Son to save us. Tell how the Son life and salvation gave us. Tell how the Spirit brings to every nation his new creation. And you have to, you have to say the words. It's, it's like it's like the old joke of, uh, of uh, Sven and his wife celebrating their 50th anniversary. And, and uh, his uh, Sven, uh, wife was kind of moping around all day. And, and Sven says, what's the matter? This is our 50th wedding anniversary. You should be happy. And she says, you never tell me you love me anymore. And he says, well, don't you know? He says, when we were married, I told you I loved you. He says, if anything changes, I'll let you know. And uh, it, it's like that. Well, we said it once, but in Christian worship, we keep saying it over and over again in a variety of ways with many dimensions. But we have to keep saying that story, that narrative of salvation history, uh, and that's kind of, I think, where I, that's where I start anyway. And then you, you have to determine how you're setting it and that the, the, your musical setting highlights not how clever you are as a musician, but how well the music and the words together uh, project toward the goal that you have. And it's in that combination of, of word and music. It's not, I'll just say this, it, it's not, as long as you have the right words, you can sing it to any music. It, it just, that's on the face of it is just kind of crazy. Uh, because the kind of music that we use uh, will affect the way we perceive something. Uh, Marshall McLuhan said the, me the medium is the message. And so uh, in the same way that you could take a sentence and say it by emphasizing different words often changes the meaning radically. And uh, the same thing is true of, of music. It, the music and the words together need to form a kind of an indelible union that projects both of them toward the goal that you want, at the same time leaving it open that there is a depth and richness in the text which enables you to continue to explore it 
so you don't hear it once and you say, well, that was nice, now let's move on to the next thing, that you can go back to it and and bring that element into it. That, that's the way I start anyway. Oh, well, thank you. Um, maybe kind of along similar lines, if thinking about young budding composers, people who want to compose for the church specifically, if you were a music student today, what areas of the church's song would be interesting to spend more time on and perhaps more so than you had the opportunity to when you were a student? Well, I would say the first thing to do is to get to know the liturgy, not to the, the liturgy of the church. I mean the the whole liturgical life of the church, the, the structures that enable this to happen, the structures of the church year, the structures of the appointed lessons, uh, the regulated use of psalmody, the development of a basic core of liturgically useful hymns, to, to not only know about them, but to live them in a congregation that sings well. And so uh, th that's probably the, the, the best way to learn what is feasible in writing, let's say you're writing one to write a new hymn to, uh, is, is to have a, the best preparation is to have experience, good singing uh, in a congregation that sings well and sings a, a variety of things. I think that's one thing, that's one thing that happens. And uh, so, you, you know, you should, I can just tell you from my own experience when I was uh, when I graduated from college, and then I was when I was my my teacher said you need to go on to graduate study, and so so what did I know? Where, where do you where should I go? When of course I ended up going to where my teacher said was a good place to go, which happened to be the Eastman School of Music. And then, of course, you had to decide, well, what are you going to major in? And so I, uh, I thought all my, my peers who were going on in graduate work were going on to study organ, and that's wonderful. Uh, but in my uh, uh, probably uh, oh, oh, youthful overestimation of my own abilities, I, th I thought to myself, I can play the organ as well as any congregation will ever want me to play, which was, of course, silly, and it's wrong. <laughs> That's what I thought at the time. So I said, I don't want to do that. So what do I know the least about? Well, what I knew the least about was theory and composition. And so I majored in theory, which, which everybody would say, oh, well, that's nice, too. <laughs> That's what I did. And uh, I am ever, ever grateful for that experience because it set me then on the path that, that I've been on. And it gave me basic, basic skills in, in writing music that, uh, that I did not know, the things I needed to know to be successful. And uh, while that doesn't mean you're going to be successful every time, it, it helps you to avoid the all too common mistakes that people who have no training uh, tend, tend to avoid. It's, it's, uh, I, think, I think one of, the, one of the things that I see a lot is that, that people who want to write music for the church feel that they can substitute for, substitute piety for a necessary knowledge of the craft. Writing music is a craft in the way that playing the cello is a craft. You, you need the skills to do that. You can't just say, well, the Lord will help me play the right, be in the right positions and do all this. And that. No, you have to learn how, what the craft is. And the craft will prevent you from making the most obvious mistakes. And Hopefully, once in a while, you, your, your efforts go beyond that into something that is maybe a little more lasting. And, and that's, I think that's kind of the way one needs to approach it. But, it, but music is a craft. And uh, it's, uh, we just need to acknowledge that if, if you're a young composer, I, I, I once wrote a piece, uh, wrote a little essay uh, entitled, um, 
advice to young composers. Mm. Now, the first thing I, I said was, in the first place, young composers are not looking for advice, especially from me. And, but I said, here, nevertheless, here are some basic things. And then I listed about three or four things, like louder is not better than softer. Faster is not necessarily better than slower. <laughs> and things like that. But the last one said, was simply because you can doesn't mean you should. And uh, sometimes you see young composers who've learned new techniques and want to use every technique they can in just about every measure of everything they're doing. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think so. I, I have a, a, a picture on the wall just outside this room where I am that we picked up in uh, Hong Kong. It's a black and white charcoal drawing of the street scene in Hong Kong. And then in one or two places, there's a dot of bright red. There are two little dots, three little dots. And your eye immediately goes to those dots. If there were 25 dots of that red on that picture, your eye wouldn't know where to go. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of what I'm saying. You, you don't pile everything that you know how to do into one piece. Maybe pick one thing. If, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're a cook and you're making, following a recipe, and they'll say, add a pinch of this spice in there. You don't, don't dump the whole can in there because that's overkill. Uh, just a little bit sometimes will will do that. And uh, so I, I, that, that's kind of the way I, that's the way I start anyway. And, and then as you work, you get on goals. And uh, well, hopefully the, it will be beneficial for the immediate case in which you're writing it. And then maybe beyond, once you've written it and send it out into the world, you have little control over it anymore. And, uh, but hopefully it will be of some benefit to, to someone. Well, it's, it's slightly after our one hour time limit, maybe just one thing in closing and then um, uh, just a reminder to everyone that we will pass along any comments, um, any other memories that you wish to share uh, via the message boards here, via email, via uh, postal mail, which I put the address in the the comments a couple times and you all have my email address so feel free to reach out anytime we'll make sure everything uh, gets to Dr. Shock and he sees uh, all of your your comments and, and memories and the few questions I know we didn't get to everything there's so many great questions coming in here um, so I think that means we'll probably have to do this again um, but just in closing looking back uh, Dr. Shock any mm -hmm. any compositions or moments or memories that really stand out to you from your your career or life that that you really look back on as being the the most impactful music anything that comes to mind well i i just think especially in regards to lsm it, it's been a, just a great joy to be part of seeing that develop and unfold and then to be successful over this long span and to see that uh, to, to see and realize that young people can get enthused about good music and learning to do it well, to do it, it together uh, in an ensemble, and then as they go back, whether that's they're going to be their ultimate vocation or not, as they go back into their congregations or wherever they go, to, to bring the insights and the understandings and the faith that they have, have been nurtured and developed in LSM into their rest of their life, wherever they may be. And that I think is a, a, a very uh, worthwhile thing and it's been very satisfying to be a part of it. So thank, I thank LSM for that opportunity. Well, thank you. And one of our, our big visions is continuing your legacy and bringing that for generations to come and preserving and living out these these music sacred music liturgical art forms um, just for future generations and we're 
we're thrilled that the future is strong, thanks to yours and many others incredible vision 40 or more years ago. And uh, here, here we are continuing. So thank you again, Dr. Shock, for all this time, your wisdom, the way you're able to, to turn these ideas and make them relatable to, to all of us. Uh, just great insight into your career, um, how you've influenced so many and um, insight into some of the music and uh, your materials that we've loved for so long. So uh, thank, thank you, you again. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you. you, everyone, and we look forward to staying in great touch. So have a good rest of your day, um, and thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you.